of God in what seemed like patchwork. The wisdom of God in what seemed to be like patchwork. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. Your word is life. Your word gives light. Psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Guide us this day, we pray. We rest in you. We look to you, all wise God, omniscient Father. We ask, O oh God, that you move upon your word this day. Lord, let your word, O oh God, not one you said shall go void, but will accomplish everything that you have sent it forth to accomplish. I surrender this vessel into your hand, Lord, for your glory and for your praise. Use it, Lord. We give you thanks again in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 55 and verse 8 to 9. For my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1 to 18. Then Joshua secretly sent spies out to send two spies from the Israelite at Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the land, the whole land. Rahab had hidden, hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk. As the gates were about to close, I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bungles of flax, so flax she had laid out. So the, king meant, so the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossing of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gates of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up to the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry, a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Shion and Hog, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. 
Then when the, they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the man had told her, we will, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, we must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. What we know of Jericho, it was one of the most important city in the Jordan Valley and the strongest fortress in all of the land of Canaan. It was the key to the western uh, Western Cana. Rahab's house was evidently located in the north w side of the city's wall. She was a Canaanite prostitute who hid the Israelite spies who came to spy out the city. The Bible states that her house was built against the city wall. Before returning to the camp, the spies told Rahab, bring your family into, into her house and they would be saved. According to the Bible, Rahab's house was miraculously spared while the rest of the city wall fell. Why was she in the wall, the outer wall surrounding the whole city, protecting it from foreign intu intruders? The inner wall was enclosed and is a central administrative compound for the palace, the temple, and the large-scale food storage. Well-do people live in the central compound beyond the second wall. Poor and destitute people like Rahab lived in the outer wall between or between the two walls. The spies leave Rahab's Jericho wall house. We see Rahab didn't desire her circumstances or her situation. Rahab was a Canaanite woman. We don't know why she was into prostitution, but we know why that she didn't want to be there. Scripture said, when she heard, she believed, and she looked for a way to escape. She said to the man, I know that the Lord has given you this land, for we heard how the Lord has dried up the Red Sea. She went up to the spies and she pleaded for her life and for the lives of her family members. She made an oath with them. Therefore, I beg you, verse 12, I swear, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. We can speculate why she was in all a tree. We can speculate why her life was the way that it was. We were told from historical record that is the poor, most destitute people who live between the both walls. We don't know if poverty drove her and her family to the lifestyle that she was recorded, she was living. We know she was stuck in the, in the wall. But regardless of where she was, she heard of this mighty God. She heard of this all-powerful God. And she made this confession. She said, for the Lord God, he is God in heaven and on earth. And because she knew that he was God of heaven and God of earth, she didn't know how she was going to get out of that wall, but she seeked to find a way out. And she realized that he is the one who did help her out. A matter of fact, she went to talk about the testimony that she heard. I heard that your God has dried up the Red Sea and gave you passage over. So even though I don't know how he's going to get me out of this wall, I believe that the same God who dried up 
That Red Sea is the same God I'm trusting, is the same God I'm putting my hope in, my confidence in. You see, Rahab didn't lead to her understanding or to her wisdom. She just heard the report of God and she had faith in him. She trusted the wisdom of God. She trusted the power of God. She trusted the report that she heard of God. And because she heard at the time, she didn't know. We read her story, and we know that God met her. We know that God reward her faith. Faith in a messed up small package that reached out to God. She trusts God to put the patchwork of her life together. You know, sometimes our lives seem to be uh, pieces of patchwork or pieces of material, fabrics, that you don't know what to do with. And a matter of fact, other people that is looking at it would say that life needs to be thrown out. For those who sew, I remember my grandma, she used to sew a lot and she would save uh, fabrics from everything that she sew. She had a little basket that she would put everything in there that she sews. For me who don't sew and who don't know the value of what in that basket, I would think it's all absolutely garbage that needs to be thrown out. But then I would see her sit down and she would take the pieces, and she would put it together to make something. And when she started, it didn't look like anything wonderful was going to come of it. Sometimes that's how our lives seem. We can't figure out how this is all going to come together. It seemed like disjointed patchwork. But that's where the wisdom of God comes in, that God, like the sower, the person who knows how to sow, know that he can make something wonderful out of this. Rahab's life looked like something that God couldn't possibly use because within the Old Testament covenant, they didn't have much use for prostitutes. They were thrown out. But God in his infinite grace and this mighty God saw something in that package that he can use. We must understand that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And our ways are not God's ways. What we call useless, God call redeemed. He can redeem. He can redeem anything and he can redeem anyone. Rahab the prostitute, hearing about God, seeking a way out of a life that may be a trap for those looking in messy. According to the law, she was disqualified. Yet we see that Rahab followed the instruction of the men and salvation came to her house. Putting the scarlet cord out the window Seem, uh, she could be like Naaman and said, is that all? Is there not enough uh, rivers or waters that I should come and go dip myself seven times? She didn't question the wisdom. She just did what the word said for her to do. She hanged that scarlet cord out the window. The scarlet cord, I believe, symbolic of the children of Israel applying the blood on the doorposts for their saving and for their deliverance. For her salvation, you see, all has to come through the blood. So that's why we believe symbolically this Canaanite woman, this disqualified woman that nobody would look at, there was a way that was made for her. No matter where we are, God sees. And no matter what it is, God is able to move any mountain, to take down any wall, to break us through. Uh, as read earlier, the, the wall of Jericho 
was a formidable wall. It was a fortress. No wonder that God said to Joshua and the children of Israel, do not speak. Because when you see this wall, you probably start to speak your own thoughts. You probably start to confess, this is impossible. Have you ever looked at any area of your life and go, I don't know, this, this will never work. I don't ever see how we're going to get out of this. And so God in his infinite wisdom know that we would start to confess what he's not saying, told them not a word. Because he remember these were the same people when they hit hard times in the wilderness said to Moses, we want to go back to Egypt. They were the same people who said, did you bring us out into the desert, or their, forf- their, their fathers were, who brought us out into the desert, desert to kill us? And God knew their heart. Just as their father were, they might be tempted to start confessing what we see. Oftentimes when we see ourselves in hard and impossible places, we start to confess, I have nothing to eat. I have no money. We start to confess our situation. And so I wonder if that's why this big wall, seeing themselves, they weren't a people who knew how to fight. They weren't tested as great fighters. And here is this big impossible wall. But again, God is the God of the impossible. God will call us into places where it seems as if there is no way. But he's the all-wise God. He went before them. He knew what was there before they got there. The blood applied to our lives is salvation through Jesus Christ for you and for me. It's still and it never loses its power regardless of the circumstances and the situation that we find ourselves in. No matter the wall, how big it may seem, no matter how difficult the circumstances that we find our lives in, before returning to the Israelite camp, Rahab asked, when you come to conquer this city, save me. Jesus Christ came and he conquered death, hell, and the grave. A matter of fact, he said to us, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, for I have overcome. Regardless of what we're going through, God, strong and mighty, God, mighty to take down any wall, goes with us. The inner wall that protects those who are well off and in better position. That's not where Rahab found herself. She found herself in the middle. Do you ever feel like you're on the outside looking in? That's how she feel. The psalmist in Psalm 73 said, Lord, I sit and I watch the wicked prospering. And it got to me so much that I almost lose my way. I almost miss a step because I sat back and I watch the wicked parading and prospering. I wonder if Rahab sought and watch the better half, as we call it, parading and enjoying the better life. Sometimes we probably wonder, why me? Why wasn't I born in the different circumstances? Why wasn't I born to a different situation? Why do I find myself in this place? The place that seemed to be no defense. The place that makes me feel as if I'm misplaced. You know, sometimes the misplaced places in our life is God actually having us in the right place. Because, see, where Rahab's house was on the outside of the wall, 
It wasn't a mistake. It was at the right place. Sometimes we walk into areas of life that they, as they said to Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And you might not live in the best part of town and you're driving by seeing all the better lawns, the better house, and you say, Lord, what if they did differently than I? Why them and not me? But the missed places in our lives could actually be the right place because see it was the place where the spies went it where the, it was a spe, it was a place where she was positioned to hear the news of what is happening around her she heard the news i wonder if uh, according to some of the stuff that I read up on Jericho, that outer section of the wall would have uh, like places to gather, as well as Rahab's house, which would, the prostitute house. So she was positioned where she can hear all the news that are going on. And she heard about this man. We have a song that we sing. I heard of that man from Galilee. She heard of this God who parted the Red Sea. And she desired a different life. She desired a, bit, a different circumstances. Sometimes we see people at a place in, our, in their lives and we begin to judge them and we don't know how they get there. The Bible didn't speculate as to why Rahab was a prostitute. I always say to people, nobody grow up as a child and their dream. You ever play with your doll as a little girl? I don't think any little girl sit down and play with their dolls and go, I want to grow up and be a prostitute. Or for that reason, a male. Circumstances and things in life lead people into a certain place. I pray that when we, as we hear of Rahab today and we pass people on the highway and the byways that have Rahab's testimony, a mercy will come into our hearts and we begin to pray for them. You see, if somebody did not talk about this God, this desire it would not be awakened in Rahab's heart. Instead of turning the other way, may we turn that way and start talking about this God who parted the Red Sea. This God, who is the hope of those who life seem to be unfair to, who is in a place of uncertainty, who has a feeling of being unwanted, undervalued, exposed, undesired, uh, undesired life that can, you would say, what can you do with all of this? What can come out of all of this patchwork of life? The cycle of your life doesn't seem to fit. What your heart's desire and your present circumstances does not match. She desire a different life within her heart, but her present circumstances is something that is undesirable. Within the within the confusion of our experience, we see this patchwork quilt. We can only see the back of it. The tangled lines of the threads. It doesn't look good. When you're putting, uh, as I would watch my grandma sew, when she put them together and have all these stitches and if you're only seeing the back, because she'll have them turn over, you're not seeing the front side of the pattern. All you see is the back side and these horrible stitches going through. And you wonder, can anything come out of that? We can't see the beautiful design that is on the front because see God sees what we can see God's thoughts is not our thoughts and his ways is not our ways we see this thread looks messy 
Nobody wants to put that on display for anybody to see. But we are not limited to our thoughts. We are not limited to our experiences. Our lives is much bigger than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. You see, God knows the plan he has for us. He knows the places where we are right now. And everything in our life he is putting together. Can you imagine? Every hurt, every pain, every discouragement, everything he is putting it together. God is putting the package, even though it looks like that, something beautiful is on the working that you and I cannot see. How can God really use the story of our lives? How can God use your life? How can God use my life the same way he uses Rahab's life? We have no clue what his, his, what his plans are. We don't often see the fullness of the purpose that he have in store for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But it is written, What no eyes have seen, nor ears heard, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Understanding that our thoughts, again, is not God's. Neither is our ways, because his thought, our thoughts are limited. His is limitless. As I was growing up and I would hear Rahab, the prostitute, this disadvantaged human being, woman, used and abuse, whether it's by human error, the community, culture, wherever it was, whatever place she was, it's no desired place. But she heard, and even in that place, God knew the plans he had for her. Where you are is not indicative of where God wants to bring you and to bring me. God has a greater plan and purpose for your life. We see another woman in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 to 14. Abraham replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Haggard so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Agar beside the spring of water in the wilderness. Along the road of Sir, the angel said to her, Agar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai she replied, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. The son of yours will be a wild man and as untamed as a wild donkey, he will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility with all, with all his relatives. Therefore, Agar, you, Agar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one? Who sees me? So that well was named Bear Laro Laharo, which means well of the living one who sees me. It is still to be found between Kiddush and Barney and uh, Bered. Genesis twenty one, fourteen to twenty. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water and strapped them on Agar's shoulder. 
Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of uh, Beersheba, where the water was gone. She put the boy in the shade of the bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Agar from heaven, Agar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Agar's eyes, and she saw the well full of water. She quickly fell her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. As we know, Rahab was Egyptian. She was a servant in the house of Sarah and Abram. A servant has no power in what the master commanded her to do. So Abraham, or Sarai commanded Abraham to lie with Agar. And sometimes us in our own unwise state, because she now have what Sarai didn't have, which was being with child, she started to show off not realizing that she still had no power. She started to show off and Sarah started to abuse her authority. She started to make Agar's life very, very difficult. So Agar ran away. The angel of the Lord said to her, Where are you coming from and where are you going? You see, sometimes we see where we're coming from, but we have no clue as to where we're going. We're on a journey, but we haven't got the full blueprint. So we talk about or we rest on our experience of where we're coming from. And we often allow it to shape where we are, not understanding that God have a greater purpose than where you're coming from. So as she sit there, she make this confession. When God asks her these questions, she says, you're the God who sees me. Sometimes the circumstances and the situation of our life make us think that God doesn't see. God doesn't see what we're going through. God sees. No matter what we're going through, no matter where we are, God sees. The child in her womb, it's no coincidence that the name Ishmael means God hears. God heard her uh, distress. God hears heard her cry, just as he heard the heart's cry of Rahab, he heard Agar's cry. And he encountered this living God. But sometimes when we encounter God, it doesn't mean that our situation changes right away. Because in encountering the God that sees her, God said to her, go back. That doesn't seem like wisdom to me. I'm expecting him to create something completely different. I'm expecting it to look something different. But the wisdom of God says, go back and submit. Oh, God, that's hard. Submit to the person. who wasn't treating you good in the first place. That's what he said. Verse 9. 
Return and submit. God's wisdom certainly is not my wisdom. And God's ways is certainly not our ways. He says, go back, submit. I believe because of how scriptures were, I believe that Agar began to trust this God who sees her and who hear her. That she went back and she submits. Scripture didn't tell us what was happening around that time. Except now we go to verse 20, chapter 21 and the woman run into trouble again. This time, it's her son. So to make, to fill in for the little part that I read in the context of chapter 21, it was the coming out of the favored son. And Ishmael began to make fun of Isaac. And Sarah said, hmm, we can't have that. You have to send, get rid of her. And this child. So here she is again in trouble by the well, crying out to God, I don't want to watch the boy die. But something struck me as I go back to chapter 15. Did not God told her that this boy, this child, God literally named this child and said, this child is blessed and he's going to grow up to be this and he's going to grow up to be that. Yet, in 21, she's saying, I don't want to watch this child die. This time, the angel said to her, God heard the child. Go comfort him. You see, in the midst of whatever we're going through, we oftentimes forget the promises of God. Because the situation that we're going through at the moment doesn't seem right, doesn't feel right. How can this thing be? How can God use this mismatch patchwork of life that I am in right this moment. This time the angel says, Agar, what's wrong? What's the problem? I wonder if sometimes when we're crying out to God, he's saying, what's the problem? What is the problem? Now, that's, that's a, 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 a sort of a, what do you call it, oxymoron? What do you mean, what is the problem? I'm thrown out. I'm on the run. The food has run out. But why is God asking her what's the problem? Because he gave her a promise. That's why I believe, I wonder if God sits there when we're moping and going, what's wrong? Because he's already given you and I the promise. He has really told us what he will do. Then God opened her eyes that she saw where the water is. Presently, we can't see where our lives are going. Presently, that's where worry and fear comes in because we can't see it. That's why the Bible says faith is a substance of hope Things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can't see it. I can't see how this is going to work out. I can't see how we're going to make our way out of this. I just can't see it. Crisscross threads, tangled lines, pretty ugly. So ugly sometimes we want to hide it. So ugly sometimes it caused depression and fear. We can't see the beautiful design that God is working on in our lives. 
Therefore, we must trust him. Have faith that what he said he will do, he will do. He said, I will make beauty out of ashes. Psalm 137, 13 to 16, he says, you made, all, you made all things delicate, inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watch me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day has passed. Before Rahab grew up and ended up in this dispute, situation before Agar grew up and become a servant with no power before you and I came to where we are God saw every moment of our lives it doesn't matter what you're facing today God knew and record every moment of our lives. It may not make sense to you, and it may not make sense to me, but God in his infinite wisdom, see many things that happen to us, he didn't cause it, but he'll redeem it, just like Joseph. He, the Bible says that God does not do evil, but he know that man is evil, and so he make provision even in the midst of the difficulties. Rest in his infinite knowledge. Take comfort, I believe God was saying. Take comfort in whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Take comfort that God knows the big picture of our lives. Submit to him. Hear, hear him. Apply to the blood of the lamb. Rahab, Rahab had to apply that scarlet thread. Agar had to submit. The Bible says we can't resist the devil until we submit to God. I can't see, but he did not call us to walk by sight, but by faith. Do not allow what we see to dictate where we're going. Because only God had that plan, and only God knows that. Rahab recognized and believed that the real God was the God of Israel. Agar wake up and realize that he is the God who sees. He saw the disadvantage. He saw how you're feeling. He sees what you're going through. He is the God who sees. He's not asleep. He's wide awake. The Lord... God of heaven above and earth below. She didn't know him very well. She heard and she believed. She risked everything to surrender to this God, to submit to this God, to trust this God to save her. She surrendered. She acted on her faith in God, believing that the God of heaven and earth who delivered the Israelites, that same God is able to deliver her. Did the whole Testament story begin, uh, finish there with her? No. She wasn't just saved. She wasn't just delivered from that wall. God will bring us to places where it's far beyond anything that we can imagine or comprehend as we're going to see in the life of Rahab. She could not foresee or comprehend what God was going to do with this life, this circumstance, this situation that she is in. How can God, what can God? But Joshua chapter 6 verse 25 tells us, but Joshua spear Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men. 
Joshua had sent a spies to Jericho, and she lived among the Israelites to this day. You know, as a young girl, I usually wonder why everywhere that Rahab was made mention, she's always made mention, Rahab the prostitute. And as a young girl, I had, and I had an issue with that. You see, you're our ways and our thoughts is not God thoughts. I thought, why do they always have to attach the woman past to her? Why do we always Rahab the prostitute? I thought it attached shame to her. I thought it meant she couldn't escape her past. But what I came to realize that it, I, it didn't highlight her shame, but it highlighted the testimony of the power of God. It highlighted the unconditional love, the grace and the mercies of God. It highlights that God can save no matter what or where you find yourself. God took her from a, we a wall shut in from freedom. But God carved out a place for her. There are some times in life you feel like you have no place or you're out of place. But God carved out a place for Rahab. He'll do the same for you. He brought her into a secure place where she came under the protection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He brought her into a place where God's people dwell. But did her story end there? No. The wisdom of God, none of us can comprehend. Let's look at Rahab's stats. This is her statistics. Rahab, a broad prostitute, conspirator, help Israel spy from being caught. Born 1400 BC, spouse Solomon, son Boaz, daughter in law Ruth, contemporaries Joshua. Ruth and Boaz had a child, Obed, who was the grandfather of King David. So let's look at this again. Rahab the prostitute, the harlot, in the bloodline of Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior. The New Testament opens with her name, including her in the genealogy. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, the prostitute, the harlot. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon. And he goes on and on. Rahab, a life that seemed to have no meaning, is now in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11 said this. By faith, the prostitute Rahab become uh, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Hmm. Our lives of greater purpose than where we find ourselves today or what we can see. We don't know the end of the book. See, if somebody did tell Rahab on that wall that God would save her, she may believe that because she heard the testimony of how God save. But if they went a little further and say, God is going to use you and make your name and your life of value. She probably would look at you and say, you have lost your mind. Don't you know my past? Have you no idea how poor I was? I think it's Saul when he was called says, I am the poorest of the tribe. What are you talking about? Don't you understand that patchwork of my life is so disjointed? How can God use anything 
of this. We only see the back of the blanket through our experiences, through what is happening right here before us, through our past, through sometimes how other sees us. But the blanket that God is making together is unfathomable, immeasurable, uncomprehendable wisdom of God who is making something beautiful out of our lives. That if we trust him, if we submit to him, if we give it all to him, he can take the sorrow, he can take the woe, he can take the distress, the disadvantage, he can take all of what we're going through and he can display and make something beautiful out of it. There's a song that they used to sing, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he makes, I'll say he's still making something beautiful of our lives. We're not resting on what we see, but we rest in the wisdom of God. That regardless of how things are looking, I will not lean to what my understanding, I will not look to what I see. I will believe the word of God that he has declared over your life and over my life that God is faithful in what he says he will do. There's nothing too hard. There's nothing impossible. There's nothing too great. There is no wall too high that he cannot bring down. There is no giant that stand before us that is too big. God, he is God. And there is none who can compare to him. May he open our eyes as he opened Agar's eyes that she could see the God who sees her. If nobody else sees you today, God sees you. If nobody else sees and understands the value of your life, the purpose of your life, God sees you. You know, in all of the people on the earth, and I'm sure probably Agar wasn't the only one who ran away that day, God sees her, and God didn't say, woman, why did you run away? He called her by name. He says, Agar, servant of Sarah. You know, we're not just a, a bunch of herd that God throw together. And um, uh, the other day, we had a bunch of people over, and I end up calling uh, different people different names. My grandma used to do that a lot. When all the kids are around, she, she would uh, mean to sometimes call me and she'll go, oh, that's it. And I go, I'm not, that's it. Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, you know who I'm talking, right? We mixed up, right? And I'm call I think I was calling JR and I go, oh, oh, hi, Nathan. And then I go, yeah, you, you know, it's JR. God's got none of that problem. Agar, servant of Sarah, you're not in the right place. Now, I would think that would be a better place than where I was, Lord. He says, no, it's not time. Go back. Huh. It's, 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 that's a hard one. And that's where sometimes the enemy trips us up because we don't hear that that God will have us in a place where we don't want to go, but say, that's where I'll need you to be right now. Because I want what I want. And I want the comfort, and I don't want to feel disadvantaged, and I don't want to feel that this is 
uh, what I need to go through. Everything from God must feel comfortable and right, and I must be happy with it. You and I say no, but when we face life hardship, that's a testimony that we declare. If it's good and great, it's God. But if it's difficult, it cannot be God. And God is saying, your ways are not my ways. And your thoughts are not my thoughts. When, when, when there are situations that usually we want to go into, for some of us that uh, grew up in the Caribbean, your parents would say to you, not everything that glitters is gold. So not because it looks good and look like that's the path, for it doesn't mean that's where you ought to go. God's ways sometimes, and that's why I love that song. It's, it's, it's sometimes if I try to figure it out myself, I'll be confused. That's why the songwriter says, all my confusion, you're not confused. He's not confused. What did Psalm 137 says? He already know. Every day. Before we, today, he knew who was going to be here. He knew who was going to have car problem not making it in. He knew every single thing. I woke up to it. God already knew it. That's our life. What we're waking up to. And we're frustrated and running around in confusion. God is sitting there saying, I know. I have it. Faith. The substance of things. Hope for. The evidence of things. Not seen. In the hard times, trust the wisdom of God. In the good times, trust the wisdom of God. In the quiet times, trust the wisdom of God. And know that it may not be how you and I want to see it. But that's where faith and trust comes in. Know that God sees right where we are. And he even sees us before we got there. And he knows everything about our lives. He's not surprised. He's not confused. He's not running around trying to figure out what am I going to do with it. He knows where every piece fit. And when he is done, you have a beauty That if people walk up sometimes, and this is the part of your life that they see, and you're going, if they ever see the back of that blanket. My grandma made me one, and then she put a cover on the back so you don't see all the ugly stitches <laughs> that is on the back. A beautiful cover and the beauty. God can make something beautiful, and he will make something beautiful of our lives. Let us trust the wisdom of God, even in this uncertain times, even in the time when everything seemed chaotic. Gas prices going crazy. War is going crazy. Disadvantage, abuse is going on. Let us trust the wisdom of God that God sees God hears, and he has a plan far beyond anything that we could imagine. Let's submit to him, trust him, get into the word, have faith in him. Because Jesus, the blood, has already applied. Let's trust him. 
we, s we sing the song, there is power in the blood. It's already applied. The power is still in the blood. The Lamb of God, all glorious, strong and mighty. The good shepherd is still with us. And in every situation and in every circumstance, we can say like David, not based on what we see, but based on who he is, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, not to trust in ourselves or circumstances the limitation of our own ideas and expectation, but in all our ways to acknowledge you. You are the all-wise God. You don't make a mistake. You're God who sees. You're the God who hears. You're the God who knows this hour before we even come into it. We submit to you. We surrender to you. We cast every cares upon you because your word already declare you care. So we stand today, O oh God, trusting your wisdom to guide us. Trust in the plans that you have for us. Submitting, O oh God, not to the distress or the circumstance or the situation, but submitting to the God who sees and the God who hears and the God who is able. And the God who knows everything, all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God. You are God over our lives. You are God over our children. You are God over our circumstances. You are God o over everything in our life. And I pray today as we leave, our testimony will be your way, Lord. You are the good shepherd. Regardless of where we find ourselves, beside the still waters, or going through the valley of the shadow of death, we'll know that you're the God who is with us. You see us, you hear us, you're all powerful, and you are leading us, and you're guiding us, as David says. You're leading and you're guiding. And we know, we know, we know that we know that we know that we will dwell in your house forever because you have made the way. And where you are, you told Philip, you will bring us to yourself. So, Father, while we're in the not yet, where we're on this journey, I ask you, O oh God, for strength within our hearts. Refocus. Open our eyes like you open Agar's eyes. Open our ears, O oh God, to hear your voice afresh and to find comfort and peace Beyond understanding, regardless of the outward circumstances, there will be joy unspeakable, and our lives will be full of your glory. We give you thanks and we give you praise. We ask that you go with each and every person for those who are sick today. We thank you, Jehovah God. You're the healing Jesus for such a time as this. You sent your word, and you heal. You continue to heal. You continue to provide. You continue to protect. Because, Lord, we are children of your kingdom. We give you praise. We give you thanks. And as we go, we go in no other name but in your name. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen.